Yes, yeah, so um, Kids and Museums is one of my hats. Uh, Mike will be pleased to know that I run a yak as well, uh, have done for eight years. Um, I wasn't Mike, sorry, that's terrible. Should I stand here? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so Kids and Museums is just one of the hats that I wear. I also run my own business called Schools Prehistory. I run a yak um, and I write for teachers. Um, my whole life basically is um, the aim is to get archaeology better known by young people and better understood. Um, with Kids and Museums, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, uh, it's a charity that was set up about 10 years ago, maybe a little bit longer, um, to help museums become more family friendly. Um, about five years ago, they started running workshops for uh, museums to, and galleries to come together and share some of their best practice. And um, I took over this about two years ago. Uh, one of the workshops that we run is on particularly on engaging young people um, in museums, it's called a teen workshop. And um, in the course of doing these, um, kind of organising these workshops, I do research into what museums are doing, who's doing something exciting, different, new, effective, and getting them together. So this is kind of pulling together some of that research that I've been doing over the last couple of years. And I've got some models of what museums are doing as well, some case studies. Um, so what I sometimes do is get research organisations to come and tell us a little bit about young people. Um, Ipsos Mori have come along a couple of times um, to t because they do some really good anthropological studies as well as uh, quantitative studies with young people um, and they tell us um, what it is that we need to know about how to engage them. Um, had one uh, lady who came along and talked about how teens are so self-centered, they're selfish, they're prone to accidents, they exhibit risky behavior, uh, and that's what's said in the media about them all the time. We have such a negative uh, view, a perception of young people. But from the work that they've done, you can see they're actually really concerned about some of the same things that we as older people <laughs> are concerned about. In fact, in some cases, much more concerned than we are. Um, I'm particularly interested in the local priorities for 13 to 16 year olds, as you can see there, where 32% of them are actually really already, by 13 to 16, really worried about their job prospects in the local area. So they're really into um, looking for something that's going to set them out from the crowd, like Mike was saying. Um, in fact, 98% of this age group believe that it's fairly important to get good exam results. Seven out of 10 of them actually see their parents as role models. So they're, they're not the you know, horrific mass of mob of young people that they're painted sometimes. Um, they really do want help. Um, I also um, uh, got some um, feedback from uh, a new direction. I always want to call them one direction, but they're not there. A new direction, um, which is a uh, research organization in London. And um, I think that probably their results are indicative of the, of, uh, the wider country. Um, they did some research into what young people think of as culture. What is culture? Food and drink was the highest one. Religion is culture. Music, clothing, and shoes are culture. Also, different cultural backgrounds, art, um, and particularly, as you can see, things like holidays, travel, parties, family, um, and your race and ethnicity. But <laughs> when pr that was the unprompted, what do you think is culture? Um, when prompted with a range of statements that they had to say, yes, that's culture, or no, that's not culture, the, as you can see, visiting a museum or gallery Everybody, all the young people could see, well, 75% of them could see that that is definitely a cultural activity. And as you, if you go down to the fourth one, visiting a historic or important modern place or building, um, so I think that kind of encompasses going to archaeological um, attractions as well, is still quite high. So when they are given the language to talk about it, then they can understand it. But what AND found was that 
a lot of young people um, don't have that language to start with. They don't, unprompted, come out with things like the arts, dance, theatre. They just don't have those words in their vocabulary. Um, so they're not going to get involved if they don't really understand what any of that is. Do you think they would understand the word archaeology? Would that be part of culture? This wasn't part of their research, obviously, but it'd be interesting to find out. Um, the other thing that they found was that when young people go along to these places, and sometimes there are workshops put on specifically for young people, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, um, they like to go with people that they know. So can could we cope if on sort of the Citizen Project, which looks brilliant, can you cope with a whole group of friends coming along all together? Will that ruin the dynamic of the group? Um, but if, if you're going to, particularly um, the young people who, we're, who are hardest to reach, want to have some friends to go along with them. Also, a lot of young people um, will be particularly put off about really what we would think of as very trivial things, but actually, if you think back to the way you were when you were 16, if you go to a group and you're wearing the wrong clothes, everyone is dressed differently to you, then you just won't go back. So they need to have, feel like they're part of something. And how we get around that, that's very difficult. Who knows? Um, so I thought I'd take you through a few m different models uh, of what museums are doing. Now, obviously, museums are very specific places. Um, museums and galleries, they have a venue which is open to the public. Um, and I'm guessing that not many of us do. We're using the outdoors or we're um, using sites that are only open for one day out of a huge program. So we'll see, have a think about which of these could actually be um, implemented in archaeology. Okay, in the London Transport Museum, they do some amazing stuff. Uh, they have, uh, it was really kicked off with the stories of the world stuff that happened in the Cultural Olympiad in the run up to 2012. Um, and they started getting um, young volunteers to come in and work in the archives and work with some of the curators and do some of the public programming as well. These young people then were hooked and they stayed. It's a bit like the yak stuff. They stay from eight till 16 and then they still want to do some more. Um, so the London Transport Museum created um, a role for them as young consultants because once they're hitting 16, 17, 18, they also need to have a little bit of money if they're going to keep on coming. Um, so they were able to hire these young people out as consultants to other museums and things like that. Um, and also within the organisation, it was really useful for them to have young people around to consult on things in the organisation as well. And they've started doing a lot of apprenticeships, which I guess are similar to the traineeships and the Skills for the Future stuff. More and more museums are, t are actually formalising this and they're taking them on as in a youth panel or a youth board. Um, now, youth panels and boards kind of come out of youth organisations. If they're supposed to be um, uh, like connections or something. If they're supposed to be for the youth, then the youth have got to have a say in what's happening. And uh, that has been taken on by museums more recently. Manchester Museum, though, um, attached to the university, um, has probably got the oldest youth panel for a museum in the whole country, I think. Um, it's been going for over 30 years. They have their own constitution, they have a chairperson, they have a treasurer, they have a bank account, amazingly, um, and they're able to apply for funding, for small pots of funding. They go to O2 and Starbucks, who actually provide little bits of money for young people. Um, they run public events um, and they um, have contributed more and more to exhibitions more recently. What they're particularly good at, youth panels, is running events that get more young people in. And these tend to be evening events involving music and pizza. But that is, uh, <laughs> I think that's kind of across the board, but they're very, very uh, popular. Um, so the Manchester Museum one is, much, is, is kind of very well set up, and there are lots of others around the country. OK. Um, there are lots, the volunteering thing is that young people want to do, they do want to have some recognition of it. And there are ways that they can do that through the Duke of Edinburgh Award, through the Arts Award, and through Crest. Has anyone heard of Crest, for instance? 
It's an um, Engineering Science and Technology Award um, that's generally run in schools. Um, but the muse museums are starting to come into it, like the Oxford University Museum of Natural History here. Um, Arts Award is, mo is generally outside school now, really, and it's uh, both Arts and Crest and DV, they follow the same kind of um, uh, pro uh, progress. So you go from, uh, you usually have um, an award for very young people called Discovery, and then you've got the Bronze, Silver, and Gold Awards. And they have to do a certain amount of volunteering. Um, for each of those levels. With the Arts Award and the Crest Awards, they're particularly doing projects that are either arts-based or science and technology-based. Um, and it's a bit like an NVQ. They're kind of showing what skills they already have and what they can do. So that's interesting. Um, something to, that is already set up can be tapped into you can be a supporter of it you don't you might be able to even get free training in how to support young people to do this but all of those programs generally attract not all the, all the time london transport museum have been very good but they are based in the middle of london so they've got very diverse young volunteering and young consultant base but most of them attract the um, usual suspects and if you're going to actually diversify the, you know, the base of archaeology, the, the background of the people who work in archaeology, and you want to work with the young people to do that, then you're going to have to do targeted programs. Now, we've seen that HLF are obviously um, giving away money. There's the Young Roots program, for instance, um, that can fund this. Often, there's very local money to work with uh, groups of um, young people who are excluded in some way, um, possibly working uh, are in uh, pupil referral units, for instance, or are neat, so they're not in employment, education, or training. Um, and there will be young people, there'll be a register of young people who are at risk of becoming neat before they actually become neat as well in the council, in your local council. Um, so it may be council money, and you might be able to actually get commissioned by um, the local council to do some work with them. Um, I just wanted to um, briefly mention the Havod and Morva Copper Works, which was an abandoned copper work site um, near Swansea. And, um, the, and Swansea University and the local council got together to create this project for, to engage NEETS in um, um, uh, regenerating the site. And they took on a commissioning model, so it was really practical, and it was clear that those young people are going to be listened to. Because the problem with the, the main thing that NEETs have faced is that they haven't been listened to their entire lives, and that is why they are NEET. They, are, um, they probably have faced lots of issues at home. They might have faced neglect and abuse. Um, they might have uh, faced uh, drug abuse at home or crime at home, um, and they've just been ignored. So they felt at, uh, at Swansea University, they felt very, very strongly that the kids had to be commissioned to do a real piece of work that was actually going to happen. So they um, got to know the copper work site. They looked through the archives and the historical documents to do with the copper work site. And they brought out what was interesting to them. And it was the stories of the people. And that's going to be interesting to all visitors. So those stories of the people that those young people have brought out written about amazingly because this was one of the things they really didn't want to do was writing they wrote about them and did art and made videos and so on that all of that information can be put into the interpretation of that site so it's a really wonderful program um, obviously if you get um uh, project money as well. You can target young people from minority ethnic backgrounds, young people with disabilities. And the, but I think the, the key is always um, to have a long-standing program that they can be um, um, integrated into once the project funding has run out. So the, um, the idea is these targeted programs, you do a specific piece of work, but you want to build a relationship with some of these young people so that they continue to be engaged in your organization. Uh, the Towner, which is an art gallery in Eastbourne, for instance, did a project called Arts Break uh, with some uh, young people with disabilities, um, particularly visually, 
um, impaired in their gallery and they created these um, audio description of the gallery basically uh, they were able they, they actually created it they re wrote it someone else recorded it, it would, they used these things called sound pens which um, people with visual impairments can pick up and take around with them as they go around the the gallery so again it's kind of um, having a real input into rather um, into the into the organization it's quite important Kids in museums, a really quick win, <laughs> that all of that stuff takes quite a lot of time, quite a lot of energy, quite a lot of money, uh, quite a lot of staff to run. A quick win could be one of the things that Kids in Museums runs, which is Takeover Day. Has anyone heard of Takeover Day? Put your hands up. <coughs> oh, fantastic. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, it's been big on Takeover Day recently because it just happens in November. There's uh, separate days in Wales and England. Um, and uh, we we kind of are the um, supervising body for Takeover Day in, um, uh, in museums and galleries and we're moving across the arts as well. Can the archaeology sector get involved? Well, obviously Stonehenge has had a Takeover Day, so we're getting there. Um, and the great thing about Takeover Day is that it can be very, very small. That's absolutely perfectly acceptable. You can work with a very targeted group of people, or you could work with a whole school, or you could work with a youth group, whatever. They can be children, or they could be young people. Um, they can, but what, what it has to be is a meaningful um, takeover. They have to actually take over part of your organization. So they have to get, it's not, it's not quite a uh, work experience, um, but if they get some training to work in the shop, for instance, in a museum, that's absolutely fantastic. If they, um, at London Zoo, they were, <laughs> they were cleaning the penguin tanks, absolutely loved it. But it's a real meaningful thing. Um, and they are involved in, um, in, in doing it, and they can be seen by the public to be doing it. It's win-win all round. Um, also, um, Kids and Museums has lots of resources to help you, and, um, uh, to, and, and obviously all of the, um, uh, the publicity is really good as well. Um, we do have other resources. Let me just see what that is. Oh, yeah. Um, so uh, one of the main things we're known for is the Kids Museum's Manifesto, which is how to be family friendly. This one's actually the uh, a Welsh and English one. Um, there's These can all be downloaded from the website as well, um, just so you know. Um, five reasons to do Arts Award, seven reasons to do Takeover Day, and how to set up a youth panel, which was created with the Jeffrey Museum, for instance. Um, and as you can see on here, we've got fact sheets on how can we involve young people if we're doing it outdoors? Well, I don't think that's particularly difficult. And probably a lot of people here have, uh, would be qualified to add some stuff to that, I think. Um, but have a look. There's quite a lot of um, useful resources on there. Um, and have a think about getting involved in Takeover Day or any of the others. So the idea is, so which, if any, of these models could work in our sector across the different bits of the sector as well, which are all, all have different challenges. But also, if you wanted to use any of them, will they do what we want them to do? And what, when I wrote that, I thought to myself, actually, is engage more young people with archaeology enough, or is it engaging them in order for them to become archaeologists? But Mike has already answered that, to, to engage them so they, they're aware of archaeology, they understand archaeology when they become adults and they're um, responsible for areas they might be in planning. They might go and work for a developer. So it's not necessarily that they'd be in charge of the, um, um, the budget for the whole country, but they may well, ha if they have more knowledge about how archaeology works, that's going to just be beneficial for us generally. But if we're doing those targeted programs as well to work with uh, the young people that we don't usually reach, then hopefully that will go some way to diversifying um, archaeology for the future as well. So thank you very much.